existed. I, now there's a mute button. I don't know that. Well, good morning. Hi, everybody out there in the internet world. Sorry about that. Um, always blessed to be here with you all. Uh, very blessed to be able to share God's word with you. This is a little different. Um, I'm not going to scramble your brains with all sorts of weird things from the Old Testament or whatever. Uh, a little more s straightforward. But, um, you know, I started thinking about what is the worth of our soul and, and who we really are as people. And I started thinking about that because I was going through some papers that my mom had in a metal box and uh, my sister Carol, in an effort to get things out of her house, dumped it off of mine. <laughs> but um, it was really interesting uh, going through papers of my parents' life. And these are things that were you know, I knew nothing about because I was just a kid and it never even occurred to me, uh, deeds to property or whatever. But I also, what really caused me to pause was I found my father's birth certificate. And I looked at the, you know, it's July 7th, 1922, and I said, whoa, that's over 100 years ago my dad was born. And I thought, isn't that something, man? 100 years from now, if the Lord tarries, not only am I going to be gone, but anybody who ever knew me is going to be gone. And so when you think about it, that actually, that actually could drive you to depression, I suppose. Um, and a lot of people have actually thought about the futility of life. And they've, you know, Jean-Paul Sartre comes to mind, wrote a great book called Nausea. I don't recommend it. <laughs> but it's, you know, this, this kind of feeling that, what's the point of this anyway? I mean, when it's all said and done, we're just gone, and then within a short period of time, we don't even, we're not even in anybody's memory, right? But the, the reality is, uh, that's not truly who we are. Um, but to get to who we are, to really understand not only the worth of our soul, but what it really means to be alive as a human being, um, the only way we're going to get there is we're going to have to learn of that through Christ. He is the one who really revealed to human beings for the very first time, you know, this is actually who you are. And in Mark chapter 8, he says, Then Jesus called the crowd along with his disciples and said to them, If anyone wants to become my follower, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Well, that sounds like a great imitation, right? Let's do that. I have to de deny myself, take up a cross, and follow you. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and for the gospel will save it. For what benefit is it for a person to gain how much of the world? The entire world yet forfeit his life. What can a person give in exchange for his life? And yet, the entire history of humanity is human beings exchanging something rather paltry for their lives. Paltry because Jesus set the bar that if you got the entire world, bad trade. That's a bad trade for your life. That's what he's saying here. Have you ever thought about it? I mean, that's incredible, right? <clears throat> and Jesus was actually tempted very early in his ministry to do that very thing, right? He was shown all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them, and he was told, if you will just worship me, the devil, I will give you all of this because it's in my power to do it. That was something presented to the Lord Jesus Christ, and he, he said, no, I'm not, I'm not going there. <laughs> but he was like the first human being in history that said that. Everybody else had exchanged their life for something far less than all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them. And yet Jesus is saying, that's a bad trade. So he's inviting us to find something so magnificent, so incredible, so amazing, so almost beyond our comprehension, that it exceeds the value of the entire world if that was offered to you. 
by losing what we currently call our life. And there's the hard part. Let's face it, that's, that's not easy. That's hard to figure just to begin. What are you talking about? And then how do I do that? How actually do I lose my life? And the word life in this verse is the word soul. It's the word suke in, the, in Greek. It's what we call soul. Um, you know, it's a, it's a pretty abstract concept, this thing of soul. I spent a good deal amount of time studying it <clears throat> when I was doing my dissertation years ago, and I've, it's, it's a big thing for me to try to understand what does it really mean to be a full human being, fully alive, um, and a full soul. And so trying to understand the concept of soul, I've, I've tried, and it's, I'm telling you, it's just not that easy. But let's simplify it. Let's, let's just call it life. Let's go back, yes, people, to Genesis chapter 2. <laughs> <coughs> I know, I know you were all worried, like, geez, he didn't start with Genesis. But it's a great depiction. So if think back to page one and two of the Bible, you know, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, and we know that what that really is talking about is giving you this depiction of how God took chaos, the dark waters of chaos, and he gave order and beauty to everything. And what was the culminating thing? What's the last thing he did? was he made human beings, and he gave them this position of rulership and authority and said, here's, here's the Garden of Eden. I want you to live here because you have access to the tree of life, and if you just will eat of the tree of life and you stay here and you, know, you stand with me, you're going to live forever. And in, in chapter 2, it recapitulates this thing, and it basically talks about how God breathed into Adam's nostrils the breath of life, and he became a living being. That's what a soul is. It's, an, it's the animated you. It's the you that only exists because God gave you life. And that wasn't just a biblical story in Genesis 2. That is true today. The only reason we are sitting here right now, and I'm not talking about being born again, I'm talking about just being a human being with life in you is because it is something that God animates in human beings, and we become living beings. Does that make sense? I mean, this is true. This is like, this is what happens in the womb when a baby is developing. There is not a single scientist, geneticist, biologist who can tell you what animates soul or what animates cells for that matter. You know who Stephen Hawkins is? He was a avowed atheist, right? I mean, he waffled at times, but he was, he just basically was. But you know what he said when he pondered the universe and everything in the universe and how it worked, which he was very knowledgeable of? He said, I get, I get I, look, I get the math. I get all the equations. But you know what I don't understand is what puts the fire in the equations? What he was saying is what makes it work? What animates it? What animates you and me? It is, what, it is what in the Old Testament is called, it's a spirit of God. But the reality is, folks, you're, this is an embodied reality. Okay, yes, we have bodies. Absolutely. By design, God decided the life I'm going to animate in you needs to be embodied. Now, he made other things that are alive that aren't embodied, right? Spiritual beings. But for us, human beings, he said, no, you need to be embodied. But don't mistake the body for your true life. And that's what the world has been teaching us forever, that you are really your body. That's who you are. It's all based on your race. Today, particularly, we, you know, we get into race, but this isn't, like, this isn't a new concept, guys. It's you, your true self, as we are taught in the university of the world, is based on your body. That's who you are. Your intellectual capacities, your race, your gender, how you look, your body form, good, bad, and different. And if you don't think that people buy into us, that, I mean, think about it, folks. This is what drives people's soul. The animated life in them, they have defined, they have now put into this box of it's based on my body, whether it's how I feel or how I look 
or what I wear on my body, what I surround my body with in terms of my home, my car. That's what the world has been taught. So when Jesus Christ said, I want you to deny yourself, if you want to find your life, you have to lose it. What he was saying is lose that, lose that lie. Lose that lie that who you truly are, your true self, and the value of that is somehow predicated on your bodies or the things surrounding your bodies, which that's a broad swath, right? I mean, when you think about your bodies and you think about all that makes up this physical thing, which is an awesome thing. I don't, don't denigrate your body. It's fantastic what God has done. It's, it's incredible what our human bodies are like and how he made our brain and our chemistry and how it, it elicits emotions and what happens chemically in your brain when that happens. That's all his design, right? But what he doesn't want you to think is that is what defines who you are. That's not, that's not true. That's a lie. And what Jesus was asking us is to give up that lie. And the thing is, we kind of all know this. Really, in the depths of our heart, if you have yet to find your life in Christ, you know it. You wake every day with this deep sensation that there's something more. Even those who are rich, it says in the, it says in the Word that those who will to be rich will never be satisfied with riches. There's never enough in the realm of our bodies, which is the material realm, to satisfy our quest for our true self. It can't be satisfied. St. Augustine said that you created us for yourself, O Lord, and our heart is restless in us until we find ourselves in you. So that's what Jesus Christ was, he was offering us. He, what he, was, he wasn't asking us to give up anything that we're going to really miss. He was asking us to give up the lie that we're something as defined by the world, the material realm around us, and instead to find ourselves in him. Because that is the only, that's the only way we're going to understand our true value, our true worth. If we are trying to find our self-worth, and think about this, go to any bookstore. Are there still bookstores? Or go to Kindle. I don't care. Go, but you know how many volumes are out there about self-help, about self-actualization, about self-realization? I mean, the drive to find ourself is huge in our culture and always has been because it's, it's something that we're designed. We need to find our true self. We're designed for that. But when you scroll back, to, you know, think about that scene in Genesis when God is breathing. I mean, this is such an intimate scene. The creator of the heavens and the earth, God himself, is breathing into the nostrils of Adam the breath of life. This is how intimate God wanted you to understand it. In Psalm 8, verse 3, it says, When I look at your heavens... The work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place. What is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you care for him? Yet you have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor. Wow. I mean, think about that, folks. The sun, the moon, the stars, when you, I mean, if you're ever out, on a night when it's really dark, if you've ever been to a place like up in the mountains where there just isn't any ambient light and all you see is the true incredible brightness of the stars from the Milky Way and, and the skies, it, it's breathtaking. It's like, it's unbelievable. It's just, you get this sense of like, you know, who am I? I'm just dust in the wind like Kansas sang about once. Um, that's a group, you guys, many of you don't know. But... <laughs> Think about this. What, what this psalmist is, is relating to us is the great truth that is as magnificent as the universe is. And we learn more about its magnificence every day, by the way. The, the web my, the telescope out there is, is just blowing the minds of scientists about how large. They, they've decided that we don't just have a couple hundred billion galaxies. We have 
at least two trillion galaxies. It's just, it's mind-numbing what God has. And yet, in the story of Genesis, that wasn't the point. That was just for us. It was just for us to look at and behold and see his glory. But what he really wanted to do is, for, is you to take the crown of glory he gives you because you're the purpose of the ages. That's why he did this. If we don't grasp that, we're going to keep looking for ourselves, and the world is going to accommodate all of us with this is what you have to have. This is what you need to do. This is who you need to be. Here's the job. Here's the house. Here's the spouse. Here's the friends. Here's whatever. Fill it in. And it's all just so paltry compared to the true value and worth that God is just saying, here, I want you to understand who you are. And that, by the way, your design in terms of this value that God has given you, crowned you with glory, that it's supposed to be unceasing, never-ending. We're to be spiritual beings with an, with, with an eternal destiny in his great kingdom. That's who we're designed to be. And, of course, it all got lost, right? I mean, this is what Adam and Eve had, and they, and they gave it up. They gave it up to go their own way. And ever since then, we've been trying to recapture it. I want to read um, Psalm 139, and I'm going to read 18 verses of it, so this is a bit long. But I really think it's good for us to, to, to listen to this. It's from the Passion Translation. Um, but put, put yourself in here and really listen to what these inspired words are saying about who you are and how the Lord looks upon you. Lord, you know everything there is to know about me. You perceive every movement of my heart and soul, and you understand my every thought before it even enters my mind. You are so intimately aware of me, Lord. You read my heart like an open book, and you know all the words I'm about to speak before I even start a sentence. You know every step I will take before my journey begins. You've gone into my future to prepare the way. And in kindness, in kindness, you follow behind me to spare me from the harm of my past. With your hand of love upon my life, you impart a blessing to me. This is just too wonderful, deep, and incomprehensible. Your understanding of me brings me wonder and strength. Where could I go from your spirit? Where can I run and hide from your face? If I go up to heaven, you're there. If I go down to the realm of the dead, you're there too. If I fly with wings into the shining dawn, you're there. If I fly into the radiant sunset, you're there waiting. Wherever I go, your hand will guide me. Your strength will empower me. It's impossible to disappear from you or to ask the darkness to hide me. For your presence is everywhere, bringing light into my night. There is no such thing as darkness with you. The night to you is as bright as the day. There's no difference between the two. You formed my innermost being, my innermost being. You formed it, shaping my delicate inside and my intricate outside and wove them all together in my mother's womb. I thank you, God for making me so mysteriously complex. Everything you do is marvelously breathtaking. It simply amazes me to think about it, how thoroughly you know me, Lord. You even formed every bone in my body when you created me in the secret place, carefully, skillfully, shaping me from nothing to something. You saw who you created me to be before I became me. Before I had ever seen the light of day, the number of days you planned for me were already recorded in your book. Every single moment, you are thinking of me. <laughs> How precious and wonderful to consider that you cherish me constantly in your every thought. Oh God, your desires toward me are more than the grains of sand on every shore. When I awake each morning, you're still with me. Uh, I don't know about you, 
but I mean that that is almost beyond words to express. And to be all to be honest with you, I I wish I lived every moment of every day with this in mind, but I don't. I don't. I want to. Uh, you know, like Paul said, I'm pressing for that high calling of God in Christ Jesus, and I want to get there. But I'm not. I'm not there. But and I don't think any of us can claim we've arrived. I think it's a lifelong process. But what a, isn't, isn't that a, a great way to live? To live with this as this is who I am. This is, this is my reality. That the true me, the true self, that the animated me, this, this person is so loved and so thought about and so cherished. Then it really doesn't matter how many days I have in this bodily existence of mine, does it? Because I'm going to go on in unendingly because he's never going to stop thinking about me like this. If I will simply accept his offer to find my life in Christ, this never ends, ever. It's true today, and it'll be true forever. That's the offer. And may, maybe now we can understand why you could gain the whole world and it's a bad trade. Because the, the, world, <laughs> the world can't offer you that. Right? The world can't add one day to your life because the world doesn't animate us. It, that's not where you find life. You find just the opposite. You know, it kind of begs the question, why would we ever choose to walk away from such a God? Why would we do that? But yet, Eve did, and so did Adam. And so is every human being who's ever lived since that time, save one. Why do we do that? Why do we choose to go our own way and to walk away from that kind of love and that goodness and that thoughtfulness that God has? And the answer to that is, well, that's the kind of world we live in, guys. You know, and it's, we shouldn't be ashamed of this. <laughs> we didn't create the problem, but we have to deal with it. We have to live in it, right? I mean, this is why we have to give our will, our conscious thought, our mind, we have to give, we have to work at this, to accept this. I know it sounds strange because it's so great. You'd be like, well, why wouldn't I? This is easy. But it isn't because the entire world militates against this. It's, you know, it's what Paul talks about in Ephesians, the systematized error of deceit in the world. It's the, it's the spiritual darkness, the spiritual powers that Jesus faced very early on, like that offered him the entire world if he would just worship them. This whole place, this whole world we live in is under this systematized error of dark powers that actually want to offer you something in trade for your soul. And the entire world is oriented. I mean, you have to, we have to respect that in some ways. Not buy into it, certainly not believe it, but we have to acknowledge that, hey, that's, that's the world we live in. So yes, it takes, it takes real deliberate effort to, buy, to take this. That's why Jesus Christ said, hey, if you want to find your life, you've got to lose it. You actually have to pick up your cross. It's like Galatians 2.20. Let's go there. This is what he means about picking up your cross and following him. This is how Paul put it. I have been crucified with Christ. There's the cross. And it is no longer I who live. There's the denial of his old life. But Christ lives in me. So the life I now live where? In my body. I'm an embodied human being. I live because of the faithfulness of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. That's why we're here in Align Ministries today. We are here because this is where we come together to talk about the one who loved us and gave himself for us. And through him, therefore, we have life. Again, we have our true selves. And I want to make sure you understand this. That doesn't make us generic people. We're all different, right? I mean, if God wanted to make like six types of human beings, he could have done it easily. Uh, it might have been easier, you know, 
right? I mean, then we could say, well, I'm a number two, and, and you're a five, and I get along with fives, not sixes, but fives. But we're, no, every one of us is totally unique. That's what, remember the psalmist? It's like he masterfully put us together in our mother's womb and made us unique. So we're embodied people. What, don't, don't think that we're going to live a life outside of our body. We're not. But in our bodies are capacities, capabilities. We have traits. We have strengths. We have attributes, all of which God knows how to exalt if we will humble ourselves enough to not try to find our life anywhere else except in his offer of Christ. That's what humility really is. It's, it's having the willingness to say, you know better than I, and if I, want to, if I want to be exalted, who doesn't want to live a life that people will go like, well, that's a great life? I mean, that'd be weird. No, I don't want that. <laughs> of course, we... we we all want the good life. We all want a, a great life. We want what we would consider to be a memorable legacy and all those, all those kinds of things. It's okay. It's in us. It's, it's part of our nature to aspire, to have rulership, to reign. You know, we've been crowned with glory, but the only way we get it is if we give up the lie and trying to make our own life and accept the life that Christ has given. And if we will do that, all the capacities, and everybody has them. We all have different talents and abilities. He can exalt, and we become who we truly are, who we were meant to be. Ephesians chapter 2. This is our history, and it ends well, just so you know. Because it starts out, although you were dead in your transgressions and sins. Isn't that interesting? I don't remember being dead. Do you guys remember being dead? That's kind of weird. I've always been alive, as far as I can remember. But what he's, why, is he, why is it called death in our transgressions and sins? Because it's not true life. It was a life of a lie. It was a life that was destined to dust. It was not the eternal, true self that God wants you to buy into and to accept as a gift from him that you will go on unendingly and unceasingly with some, as somebody who has a destiny in his kingdom. Therefore, it was what he calls, it was death. You were dead in your trans transgressions and sins in which you formerly lived according to this world's present path, according to the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the ruler of the spirit that is now energizing the sons of disobedience. So here's, here's the cosmic reality, or the geography of our, of our world. There are rulers, dark rulers, right? Kingdom of the air, ruler of the spirit that energizes sons of disobedience. Who, who are those? Who are those guys? Worldly people, worldly leaders. The way that spiritual dark powers rule in our daily lives is through human proxies. They are energized by dark powers. They don't know it. They actually think they're doing this Frank Sinatra thing. I did it my way. You know, they don't know that. But that's the reality of, of the world in which we live. So what we've, we've been brought out of that, right? We've, we have been rescued out from that, those powers of darkness and set into a whole new reign and rule called the kingdom of God, right? But we are still, we are still <laughs> dealing with the fact that we have the residue of having lived this present path of the world because we formerly lived our lives that way with cravings of our flesh, it says, indulging the desires of the flesh and the mind. And we were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. That's our, that's our history. We can't shake that. You know, we got to deal with that. But the way we deal with it is we lay it down. We put it off, and we put on the new creation that's in Christ. That's what it means to lose our life to find it. Um, and God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even though we were dead in transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you are saved, and he raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. Wow. 
to demonstrate in the coming ages, this is us, we're the demonstration, the surpassing wealth of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. Remember Psalm 139 and how he spoke of us and how he thought about us and never, you can't shake God's love and his goodness and his thoughts for us. It's going to take all the ages for him to display in us his surpassing, the surpassing wealth of his grace in kindness toward us. Wow. That's who you are. That's who you are right now. Sitting here right now, that's who you are. That's your true self. For by grace you are saved through faith, and that is not from yourselves. It is a gift of God. You can't possibly earn this, folks. <laughs> There's no boasting in this, right? Um, we are his workmanship, and that's the word masterpiece. Having been created in Christ Jesus for good works that God prepared beforehand so that we may do them. I mean, the beauty of our inner being, of that animating life that God breathed into Adam's nostrils that exists in every one of us has been returned to us. The beauty of that is who we truly are right now. You know, and the, the word that's used in the Greek for this word workmanship is the word masterpiece, poema. You're like a poem or a great work of art in God's eyes. Do you live that way? Do I live that way? Do I wake up every day and do I spend every moment of every waking day with that as my self-identity? And my answer is no, not always. You know, sometimes I buy into somebody else's depiction of me and it makes me feel less. Sometimes I seek for something that's outside of the realm of the kingdom of God, thinking that it's going to be pleasant or helpful to me, and I realize, uh, nah, not so much. And so I redouble, and so do you. We, we just, we, we once again faithfully come back to, no, I am going to find my life, my true self in him. And again, I really want to emphasize this guy, because this is, this is, this can, you can like, really mystify this, but let's demystify it. This is just you trying to become a full human being. You know, uh, a great uh, early church father, Saint Arrhenius, I think it's called, he lived in the second century. So he, he knew some of the guys who wrote the Gospels and stuff like that. He, he said that the glory of God is a human being fully alive. This was a very prevalent belief, by the way, that that God got glory if we were to live a full life. Isn't that something? And that's who we are. So that's, that's the invitation. It's, it's not, let's demystify it so we can understand. It's just about living within the bodies you have, within the capacities and the capabilities that you've been blessed with, knit together in your mom's womb, right, amongst all the other human beings out here, but... but a new creation in Christ, something that has been given new life, raised from the dead when he was raised from the dead, because we've accepted his offer to find our life in him. Is this making sense? So when we miss the mark, don't think of sin as, oh my God, it's a moral failure God's disappointed and upset in me. And because, well, that might be true. I don't know. I don't think God, it's, I don't think he's shocked, okay? I think he's seen it once or twice before. I think it's, it, you know, what it is, it's, it's we are allowing our true self, who we really are, to be disfigured. See, we're, we're allowing a masterpiece to be hacked at. That's really what sin is. When we decide to walk away and, and get off that path that's in Christ, that's what's happening. You know, it's, it, it's like Galatians 6 says, Paul says, if you sow to your flesh, if you, if you think you're going to find yourself in your body and all the things surrounding you that way, you're sowing corruption. It's this erosion of your true self. 
That's why we don't want to do that. That's why we want to encourage each other to, to good works and to worthy endeavors. And, and that's just to be who we truly are. And if we can grasp this, if we can, and, and, and this, by the way, you're not going to get this in a 40-minute teaching, okay? I can't. There's no way I'm going to be able to explain it to you. And you're not going to get it. You could read the Bible a hundred times on your own, and it's going to be great, but it's not, this is, you can't get to this without being directed to it through the Spirit of Christ in you. That is the only way this is going to come to us and, and we're going to be able to really grasp it is it has to be a revelation that's going to come to your thoughts, for sure. That's how this works. You're going to, all of a sudden, you're going to have some thoughts here that through the Spirit, Christ is leading you to. If you ask, you've got to ask Him. Because God never steamrolls anybody. And Jesus does the will of the Father, and he doesn't steamroll you either. But if you will ask, if you will ask, he will teach you. It's what he promised his disciples. Remember he said he was sitting with the guys the night, night he was going to be captured. And he said, you know, it's a good thing I'm going. And, of course, they looked at him like, are you out of your mind? This can't be good that you're going. No, it's a good thing. Because if I don't go, if I don't do this and I don't go, I can't send you. Holy Spirit. But if I do go, I will send you Holy Spirit. I have so many things to share with you, he said, but you can't, you can't get them right now. But I'm going to send the Spirit of truth, and it's going to guide you into all truth. That is how we will grasp this. That's how. So how do we get the Spirit to teach us this? We have to ask, and then we have to, this is, what we, this is our job. We orient our minds our thoughts. This is where reading scripture really comes in handy. This is where fellowship and other things and prayer and disciplines we do in our life really help orient our thoughts so that we're in a position. So when we ask Christ, the Spirit of Christ, to teach us so I can see myself in the mirror like this, it's, it's, you're teachable because <laughs> you've now got things in your mind. This is why Paul said that if you want to be transformed, it comes through the newing up of your minds. That's our job. But it's the spirit that actually will then transform us by making us aware of who our true self is. And the more we understand that, more, uh, the, the fruit of that, well, it's, it's the fruit of the spirit. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. These are the things the entire world is seeking after and want. And it's, it's there for us because God so loved us that he gave us his only begotten son. Okay? Thank you.